Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Skidmore. I'm the director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. And uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the title of the webinar is Expanding the Intelligent Community Extension Program. Um, so the webinar is going to showcase some results of a project uh, looking at uh, communities that implemented their intelligent community checklists and uh, the uh, different ways that um, that sort of worked out and planned. Um, several educators in Indiana and Nebraska were also trained along the lines of intelligent community design. Um, the speaker today is Dr. Roberto Gallardo from Purdue Extension and, and the Purdue Center for Rural Development. Uh, Roberto is, an assist is the assistant director of the center and um, a Purdue Extension Community and Regional Economics Specialist. He holds a degree in electronic engineering, ele electrical engineering, a master's degree in uh, economic development, and a PhD in public policy and administration. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Roberto. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to note that we have a couple of upcoming webinars that I hope you'll keep in mind. Um, there's also a little questionnaire that you can fill out, um, which helps us and helps our speaker with uh, where you are and your interest in these things. And um, with that, I will pass it on to Roberto. Um, Roberto will be tracking any comments or questions that you have, um, and will either address them along the way as he sees them or maybe at the end. So with that, um, thanks so much for being here. And uh, Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, I'm hoping. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, Crystal. Uh, this is, uh, has been a very fun project. Um, so I, I appreciate you filling out the, the quick uh, question we had at the beginning if, uh, uh, to answer if your community has any digital inclusion strategies uh, as part of their overall economic development efforts. I'm, I'm thrilled to see that, uh, you know, about 42%, 43% said yes. Uh, uh, not sure and no is, is the majority, but still it's good that, that, that three of the, of the seven that have responded uh, did say uh, yes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna get started. Again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to uh, write them at, at, in the chat box and we'll be, we'll be glad to, uh, to, uh, to address those. Um, first and foremost, well, thank you obviously to the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development that made this study possible. Uh, that without their support, this would have not been uh, uh, possible to expand the, the program, uh, and uh, I'm going to give you a little bit more background later on. Um, and I and, and also want to take advantage to kind of clarify, I've gotten uh, some uh, feedback about the, the title of the, of the program and perhaps how it could portray or sound a little bit, uh, you know, kind of uh, elitist and, and so forth. So I wanted just to clarify uh, that this, uh, this concept is uh, from a worldwide think tank called the Intelligent Community Forum. And it's basically called this way to distinguish from another concept that's uh, around a lot called smart cities. Um, you know, smart cities are, are those that uh, implement Internet of Things to kind of streamline services, you know, reduce cost, make become a little bit more efficient. And the, the concept behind intelligent is to distinguish of smart, not assuming that some communities are dumb. It's more so to say that an intelligent community is much more than a smart community where an intelligent community could incorporate some smart city strategies, but it is much broader than that. So I just wanted to clarify that from the get go. Um, today, we're going to we're going to cover a, a little bit of a background of what the digital age is, why this program. I think it's important. I will then provide a quick overview of what the program is. And then we're going to zero in into the study and the results. Again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to to uh, to type uh, in in the chat box. So let me let me start by uh, I like this uh, 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 stat uh, that to reach 100 million users uh, worldwide, uh, you know, it took the telephone 75 years. The majority of those were obviously building the infrastructure, but still. It took 75 years to get 100 million users to adopt uh, the telephone. Um, the mobile phone, it, it, it took 16. Uh, the World Wide Web, it took seven. 
Facebook, it took four years to reach 100 million users. Instagram, it took two years. And then Pokemon Go, it took one month. And uh, obviously, the, the amount of time is going down drastically, and more and more people are really uh, adopting the technology. Another uh, point in case is the, uh, this image here that shows the Vatican when uh, Pope John Paul II passed in 2005, and then again uh, in, uh, eight years later when Pope Francis was about to deliver his, his first speech as Pope. You can see the difference there is uh, a bunch of screens. Uh, but uh, obviously, don't be too harsh because you can see that there is a, a flip phone there in 2005. I don't know if you recall trying to text or send an email even, though that was not possible. But texting on a flip phone was really an interesting ordeal. This kind of just shows uh, quickly uh, you know, that technology is being, digital technology is being adopted rather quickly. And, and of course, this has some implications as we're going to find out later on. Uh, the the uh, Bureau of Economic Analyses is, is uh, a, in a very conservative way attempting to measure the digital economy. It's a moving target. It's not uh, like uh, set in stone in, in by any means, and it's very conservative, I think. But it's still it's it's an attempt to measure it. And so, as of 2017, uh, you know, it was about. Uh, 5.1 million jobs directed from the digital economy. I believe they identified about 40 to 45 industries, maybe. I would have to go back into the fine print and kind of see what exactly they're measuring, but it amounted to $1.35 trillion of the, of the U.S. economy, or about 7%. And the average compensation was of around uh, you know, $132,000. The median household income in the U.S. is 60 or so, 59. So it's uh, double that. And the kicker here is that uh, you don't necessarily need to be in those dense urban areas uh, 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 to benefit from the digital economy. Obviously, not all the sectors are going to benefit from this, but still, uh, as the economy and workforce continue to digitize, there, you're gonna have, you know, contribute to this number. So that's another stat that I wanted uh, to share with you all today. Um, another study came out from the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, their tech division or department, in partnership with Amazon. So the, the, you know, the results have to be interpreted with a grain of salt. However, uh, based on my work, anecdotal with real businesses, I think it's pretty, pretty clear. And it's pretty close to what this study found that if uh, suddenly all the uh, potential of uh, rural businesses, the digital potential were unleashed, uh, you know, it would contribute about $47 billion to the U.S. economy every year. Uh, and it would generate in the next, uh, you know, in the first three years of this unleashing this potential, 360,000 jobs. Uh, so most of these would be in rural communities that, as we know, those of us that work with rural communities, it is a significant number. Uh, so this obviously Amazon has a, a vested interest in everybody using their platform, blah, blah, blah. But still, I think the methodology is solid enough to kind of to kind of uh, discuss these stats. It is not being unleashed, however, because there is not uh, adequate digital connectivity in rural areas. Um, the, the talent pipeline of candidates that could work in these moms and pops uh, is not there. Um, uh, and many times these moms and pops do not know to ask or look for digital skills among their potential employees. So that's a big, big, big one. Uh, and lastly, some of these businesses are simply not adopting digital strategies and, and digital uh, you know, uh, uh, services and so forth. So that's, those are the three main barriers of, as to why uh, these numbers are not being unleashed. And so again, uh, we're going to go back to this uh, later on, but this is uh, something interesting to, uh, to, share, with, to uh, share with you. Uh, we did a study, uh, my colleagues from Ag Econ here at Purdue did a phenomenal study uh, that in fact was cited by the Indiana governor uh, last year or two years ago to uh, justify investing $100 million in rural broadband. And the reason was because the on, on average there was about 
uh, uh, for every dollar invested in rural broadband, the local economy got back four on average. It was based on co-ops, on REMCs, so it's an average there, but still the authors acknowledge that it's one of the highest ratios they've seen. Um, and uh, the two key drivers of this were telemedicine and adult education. Again, uh, internet may have started as an entertainment uh, tool, but now it is really uh, becoming more and more important and critical. So uh, this is a very interesting ROI. And, and um, so if you need that kind of stat uh, uh, to kind of convince uh, some folks in your communities as to why invest in rural broadband, uh, please uh, drop me a line and I'll be happy to share this study with you. I'm sure your, the rural portions of your states are very similar to Indiana. So, But telemedicine and adult education were the two main drivers of this high ROI based on the study we, we completed. And here's a very interesting uh, uh, graph. Uh, this one shows that the average distance has tripled uh, among inventors. And uh, this is interesting because uh, everybody talks about an innovation and the need to be in very dense urban areas to kind of be able to really, really innovate. Well, there's a couple studies that have come out. Uh, one from our uh, one from uh, the Northeastern, uh, from Stefan Getz, you know, found that the innovation is more widespread than what we would like to think. Another study that we did as well, part of that same kind of funding mechanism. Uh, with my colleague Brian Whitaker from Oklahoma State, we also found that rural businesses are innovative. Uh, they're just not being measured in the same way. Uh, but regardless, this shows that, uh, in fact, uh, the distance between these folks are, are it, it has tripled. Um, <clears throat> there are many reasons for this. Uh, some of these may still be in, in larger urban areas, but the point is the potential. I know that many of my urban uh, counterparts uh, argue, you know, that that they have seen this before, the death of distance, and that that didn't, you know, result in much uh, many uh, uh, much change. However, you know, back in the day, the internet was a lot more less or a lot less sophisticated, right? When they were talking about the death of distance, they were really talking about email and fax machines. Uh, now it's a lot more sophisticated than that, so it's a potential. I'm not saying it's going to play out, but the there are some numbers that are starting to show kind of where, where, where this is going. Uh, so this is uh, really interesting. However, we have a problem, right? Uh, and as you all know, rural uh, broadband infrastructure is a problem. Uh, internet adoption rates in urban areas is also a problem, especially among those low income areas. But this is just unacceptable. Uh, in 2020, you know, our farmers are struggling uh, to to connect and uh, you know they contribute uh, farms that contribute 80 billion to the US GDP they run on limited internet connections uh, you know 30 one third of them said that lack of internet affected their equipment purchases some per purchase equipment and you know with all the bells and whistles and they can't really truly leverage this because connectivity is an issue uh, so all this potential that I just shared with you and some indicators that are starting to indicate uh, uh, that uh, economic activity and innovation can really truly be, truly be a little bit more widespread rather than, uh, uh, you know, concentrate in, uh, in dense urban areas. It, it's hard to play out because of these connectivity issues and others. Workforce development is also going to be impacted big time. Uh, you know, a third of, of U.S. workers are expected to shift occupational categories in 10 years. If your local community does not have adequate connectivity or workers do not have uh, the decent foundational or the basic foundational digital skills, they're going to struggle to reskill. Um, and so that's that's important because, again, a third are going to be displaced and are going to have to shift occupations. So uh, not all of them will require a broadband connection and digital skills, but I'm guessing at least more than half of these will require this uh, infrastructure and, the, and these skills to be able to kind of shift their occupations and reskill and so forth. So there's a, a tremendous workforce development implication. Uh, and, and another front, this one is kind of old, the four years old, uh, but still very, very significant where half of U.S. adults back then 
uh, considered themselves unprepared, traditional learners are reluctant when it came to digital readiness. So that's uh, only 17% where they uh, said they were digitally ready. So this is again, uh, very important to keep in mind uh, because uh, you know the, all this is gonna play a very key role as our communities continue to transition into this digital digital mindset. So, so it's important to keep that in mind uh, uh, as well. Let me, uh, so what can be done? Well, uh, there's multiple things, but the first thing is we've got to start thinking in terms of digital inclusion. Um, there are many definitions of digital inclusion, uh, but uh, the one that I really like is this one. It's all about the meaningful use of the technology for social and economic benefits. Uh, I know that some folks may look at digital inclusion and think about, uh, you know, targeting those that are less fortunate. Yes, that's part of being digital inclusive, but to me, it is broader than that. It is ensuring that your workers have the skills, right, and the connectivity, that your businesses have the capacity to compete in the digital age, that the homework gap, meaning that your students don't go home, uh, expected to go online and they can't. All this is really revolving around digital inclusion and to me as a community developer, I think it's critical that we start thinking of uh, incorporating digital inclusive strategies into these wider community development efforts. That's kind of the first step that you can take as a community, as a community development practitioner to really start helping your community around this uh, uh, situation. Uh, the digital divide, which is a, a first cousin of digital inclusion, or in fact, the, uh, digital exclusion is a result in part of the digital divide, uh, you know, has been evolving, right? Uh, uh, you know, back in the day, it was all about first level divide, what's called, you know, access, yes, no, period. Do you have access, yes or no? Uh, now it's evolving a little bit more from a research perspective, more into, okay, wait a minute, you have access. Uh, but how are you using it and why are you using it that way? So the second level divide looks more at differences in, in technology use, not necessarily internet, but just the technology, digital technology. And then the third one is, um, uh, do these differences in use, uh, do they lead to different economic, cultural, social, and personal outcomes? In fact, there is a researcher from Europe that just coined the digital capital. And I think that could be a, one of uh, one more capital to add to if you're familiar to the community uh, uh, capital frameworks. Digital capital is the ability to really translate uh, online benefits into offline uh, benefits and, 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 and all that it entails. But uh, that's where we are right now is the meaningful use of the technology and looking at how the term or the concept is evolving from a research perspective, I think it's pretty important for us to start looking at this. Unfortunately, many, many, many rural communities are still stuck in that first level divide kind of concept uh, where I understand infrastructure is an issue, uh, but they totally overlook the larger piece of, uh, of, um, of digital inclusion. So to kind of put it a little bit more into perspective, um, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, which uh, I'm part of, uh, as a disclaimer, I'm, I'm a board member, but if you can join this awesome alliance, I think you will learn a lot. It's uh, nonprofits and it's local governments and it's practitioners that are involved in digital inclusion efforts across the country. Uh, but this NDIA identifies five dimensions of uh, digital inclusion. Uh, obviously the first one is affordable and robust broadband, internet enabled devices that meet the needs of users. Many times, uh, you know, we may have only access to a mobile device and uh, research is pretty clear that if that is the case, you are not truly leveraging the technology like you could or should. Uh, digital literacy training is another key one. Quality technical support. Many, many folks, especially older folks, may be hesitant because they don't, they don't feel they have the technical assistance needed for them to adopt uh, these uh, applications and devices. And also small business owners, you know, they're, they're, they're busy running their business and they may not uh, feel comfortable enough. So quality technical support is very important. And last but not least is applications and content, you know, that encourage part participation, 
collaboration, self-sufficiency, etc. Uh, that, uh, that part is really, really one that we need to work a lot more, especially in rural communities. Uh, most of the, of the applications that uh, we end up adopting here in rural communities tend to be urban focused and urban inspired. So we need to start thinking, why don't we, why can't we produce our rural focused, rural inspired content and applications? I think that would be a, a game changer. So these are the five dimensions. And again, unfortunately, uh, in many rural development circles, we only focus on number one and we're overlooking the other four. Uh, and if your community is not digital inclusive, I think that's the number one threat to community economic development uh, today. So, so that's kind of where we are on the digital inclusion. So uh, uh, any, any questions or comments before I pivot to talk more about the program itself, the Intelligent uh, Community Extension Program that again, I wanna just clarify about the name intelligent. This does not assume or imply that there are communities that are dumb, uh, uh, not at all. It's more to distinguish from the smart city concept uh, where it's more on the IOT. Intelligent community is more, is more holistic as I'm gonna cover shortly. Uh, any, any questions or comments th thus far on, on the implications on digital inclusion, community development, and kind of the digital age trends that I've shared with you? I guess, uh, I guess not. Okay, uh, so we'll continue. So what is the Intelligent Community Extension Program? Uh, uh, the Intelligent Community Extension Program, uh, let me go ahead and, and cover this already. Uh, uh, we'll show the animation here. So it, it started in Mississippi. Um, I, my, I, I started my career in Mississippi. That's where we were piloting this. I also reached out to my wonderful colleagues in Nebraska, and, and we've been kick, you know, kind of kicking this concept idea of how can we kind of embed digital inclusion strategies into a wider community development uh, effort. And uh, and the and the the result of that thinking was the Intelligent Community Extension Program. Uh, the Intelligent Community is one that, uh, whether through crisis or foresight, understands the enormous challenges of the digital age and takes conscious steps to prosper in it. They're not reactive, they're more so proactive. So if you fit this criteria, you're considered intelligent, again, not assuming or implying that others are dumb just because they don't grasp this concept. That's not the, what the name implies. Uh, and, it, and it uses six indicators. This uh, the Intelligent Community Forum uh, is the one that developed this. Uh, they are a worldwide, a global think tank and uh, Notice that four of these six indicators are, are really traditional, what could be considered traditional economic development indicators. Uh, however, we do add a broadband connectivity and digital equity. And um, when you add those two ingredients and then you, you, you reassess your community with these six indicators, uh, you, 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 you will find a different community. You will see a different community. And then that I've seen with the more than 20 or 30 communities that I've worked with across the country to some form or fashion through this process. Uh, that's what we you kind of see. Uh, this one to me has been the best way to, and I hate this academic word, but to operationalize that digital inclusion kind of concept. Uh, more so from a community development perspective, this is the best way I've found to do so, is to be, uh, embed this into a self-help uh, community development approach, uh, asset mapping. Uh, and so the first thing you've got to do is increase awareness, uh, talk about the, the trends, the potential, what communities are missing, right? Communities don't know what they don't know, and they are busy running the community, uh, the leaders are, and so they may not be very much aware of, of what's happening, uh, why the socioeconomic or how quickly the socioeconomic landscape is really digitizing and changing. So increase awareness, form a task force. These could be swapped. Uh, this is what the, the uh, you know, you could have a task force first uh, with a key group of leaders that you've identified that are kind of uh, conducive or, or interested in this topic. And then you increase awareness through presentations and informal conversations and so forth. And if the community decides to move forward, then uh, you can complete a checklist, which is online. <clears throat> I did publish a journal of extension article uh, last year, two years ago, I can't remember, 
where I kind of discussed the main findings from the Mississippi uh, experience, which allowed me to then replicate this in, in a couple communities in Nebraska and a couple communities in Indiana. Uh, but once you complete the checklist, uh, you, then you get an idea of, of where the gaps are, where the assets are, and, uh, and then you execute and document. And then towards the end, which is way down the road, it's more of an outcome perhaps, or the cherry on the cake, is you recognize, uh, you, you, you know, you could nominate these communities to be considered the intelligent community of the year, or, and so forth, but that to me is really the icing on the cake. Uh, the actual cake is more on the awareness part and identifying assets that you did not know you had from this digital kind of mindset. Um, uh, situation. So that's what the Intelligent uh, Community Program is all about, is uh, go through that uh, 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 using this framework of six indicators embedded into the self-help asset mapping approach to community development, and you go through these steps uh, to kind of get these communities really to change their mindset. Um, uh, as we all know, community development takes time, uh, but once they realize it kind of clicks, uh, the community can take it from there. It's, it's, it was designed uh, this way. Uh, but uh, so this, again, and it also helps create demand for other potential programs that you may have within extension or non-extension uh, that otherwise may be hard for the community to kind of run, uh, you know, take and run with it. Uh, I've seen it, if you embed it under this overall umbrella, I think it, it, it makes it easier for them to to come back and say, by the way, these are the gaps that we found, but here are some extension resources that can help. Uh, you know, some of these may be uh, Utah's program remote work certification. It could be the digital ready business. It could be the eye front door that we've developed, and I'm going to talk more about that later on. But the, the key thing that I want to mention about this process is it is community driven. Uh, extension plays more of a resource facilitator guide. Extension could be the key person banging, uh, beating the drum on this, or it could be the mayor, or it could be the local economic developer, and extension kind of is, is uh, facilitating the process. It is community driven. It is again based on, on, on asset mapping. Uh, so it tells the communities what they do have, uh, not necessarily what they're lacking. And so I think it's uh, it's been a very interesting process thus far. I've been tweaking it and learning with every community that I work with. So I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of what this uh, program is all about. Uh, because of this uh, funding from NCRCRD is that now we, we are, uh, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the study and then the findings. Uh, uh, so what the study proposed is to, because again in my work and my limited work with some Nebraska communities through other grants, uh, uh, other funding, especially the Rural Futures Institute, and uh, here in Indiana with a couple planning commissions that were interested in this, is that we were able to complete the checklist or the report. And so the study really looked, uh, asked NCRCRD, let us implement uh, this community uh, checklist and, uh, uh, you know, the community identified priorities from this checklist, these recommendations, let's implement and see uh, you know what what they what do they gravitate uh, towards and how how can that inform tweaking the process even further down the road? So that's exactly what we did. We selected uh, four communities, two in Indiana and two in Nebraska. That again, uh, the two in Nebraska were involved in another project uh, that, by the way, resulted in a program that also kind of supports this overall effort. But I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, so that's what we did. And then they, they completed, they went through their checklist and said, you know what, if you do have funding available, we would like the money for these kind of projects. Um, and based on that, we, we learned, okay, so these are kind of the things that based in these rural contexts that they're more uh, likely to, to kind of request. So how can we incorporate that into the training? So that's really what we did. We fine-tuned the program and we incorporated these funding patterns and Im implemented the, the feedback and then they turned around and uh, trained uh, 10 extension educators, uh, six in Nebraska, uh, four in Indiana, and, and, and two external stakeholders in Nebraska, and I'm going to cover that shortly. But that's the crux of the study is we had the checklist, we had some money, 
okay, community within your context, within your awareness, what do you need funded? And that that helped in turn inform, uh, okay, how can we better tweak the program as we train more folks uh, down the road? That's kind of the, the gist of the, of the project. Uh, so some of the results uh, here, uh, we had, uh, we worked again with four communities uh, that had completed a checklist. We budgeted up to 4,000 for each to implement the checklist action items. These action items were identified by the community based on their priorities, the resources, whatever. It, it, we did have nothing to do with that. They, they selected that from a list of recommendations that in turn were selected based on, on how they completed the checklist. Um, uh, Ravenna, Nebraska, which is a phenomenal small community in, in, in Nebraska, received almost the $4,000. Uh, Richmond, Indiana, which along with Union City, Indiana, which were the two communities here in Indiana, they partnered. They said, you know what, can we, they're close together, we want to do this a regional effort. And they did. And then uh, the other, the fourth uh, community in Nebraska, unfortunately dropped out, which was a lesson learned. Uh, because obviously, as we all know, there are other issues. There are staff limitations. There are time limitations. So that was a lesson learned that I'm going to cover shortly. Uh, but they dropped out. So their funding was was put back towards this regional effort. So all in all, we had budgeted 16000 We got 12000 to the region in Indiana. And then we got 4000 to Ravenna in Nebraska. So now I'm going to share with you what exactly what kind of what they uh, focused on. Uh, the uh, all the communities really selected items under knowledge workforce which was not surprising in a way we all know from a public policy perspective if you can frame anything around workforce development it gets the policymakers attention so uh, not surprisingly these communities did find among the the recommendations under the knowledge workforce indicator of the intelligent community framework they kind of uh, zeroed in on those uh, but uh, Ravenna, Nebraska also uh, asked some money uh, for advocacy, which is another of the indicators, and, and, and so that was uh, very interesting. Uh, Ravenna, Nebraska came up with uh, something kind of uh, similar to what's called the conveyor belt. They requested money under Knowledge Workforce, again a recommendation that they selected, to implement an entrepreneurship curriculum. But not only that, they also tried to get some sort of makerspace equipment, not a full-blown makerspace, but some sort of makerspace equipment into the high school initially to perhaps help these entrepreneurs that were going to go through the uh, program that perhaps they needed uh, some of this uh, uh, makerspace for some of their prototypes or some of their business ideas. And then they also requested money to uh, beef up their shop local online platform. So as you can see, they were very holistic in the way they approached this because they kind of designed this conveyor belt. Well, let's teach these folks entrepreneurship. They may need some sort of makerspace and then perhaps they also need a platform to sell. Uh, so that's kind of the approach that Ravenna followed, which was fascinating to me. Um, that's kind of what they, they focused on, uh, which was really, really interesting. Uh, Eastern Indiana, they went, it's totally under knowledge workforce. They said, we've been trying to get a regional robotics program off the ground. And because that was one of the recommendations based on the checklist they completed, uh, they said, we're going to launch a regional robotics program. So kind of that's the gist of what each of these communities did with uh, when they received uh, funny, uh, funding to, to do this. Um, <clears throat> so here is some pictures of... of uh, what uh, Eastern Indiana did. I am told that uh, this May they will hold their first ever regional robotics uh, uh, competition, which is phenomenal. Again, they were kind of thinking about it, but this process really was the thing that pushed them overboard and said, you know what, let's do this. And so again, it helps kind of either solidify or create demand for, for some stuff that you may have going on in your community that may lack a larger umbrella to latch on so that's what happened here they purchased 30 robots they've uh, worked with 10 schools they launched five new robotics programs they expanded a, a, a existing five uh, existing uh, programs they've reached approximately 120 students 
uh, and they secured two thousand dollars from a uh, private sector company to uh, help them uh, leverage the money that the NCRC already provided. So again, it's a win-win, right? The the private sector chimed in. They said, you know what, this is important. They've got a plan, right? They've got the checklist. They've got the action plan, and they they've got additional funding. So let's pitch in two thousand dollars. And you can see just the the pictures of the kids are just priceless, uh, and and it and it feels uh, uh, very very good to to see that you're you're impacting and changing lives that way. Uh, here is the Ravenna. That's their shop where you live directory. Eleven students completed their entrepreneurship. They purchased three makerspace equipment. Uh, it was initially placed in the school, but then it was moved out to the library, where hopefully there will be a a permanent makerspace. It also helped uh, uh, this la laser cutter uh, fundraising was already in play uh, when uh, they participated in this project. So again, it kind of strengthened that, it leveraged that, and so they it helped uh, kind of get an additional $17,000 for the laser cutter. And 11 businesses have uh, organized and utilized the shop where I live. Not all of them started through the entrepreneurship, so it's an, an added resource uh, for other businesses in the community. One of the business owners or entrepreneurs did use a laser cutter to print or do some sort of promotional material for, for their business. So again, it's kind of this very cool concept of, okay, let's teach them entrepreneurship skills. Let's then provide them some sort of makerspace equipment if they need it, and then uh, you know, let's also provide them with an online platform for them to sell. So that's a very, very cool uh, uh, example here with uh, with uh, Nebraska. So what so what were the lessons learned for the program, uh, tweaking the program? Well, we learned a lot. Uh, you know, this coupled with what I already had learned in Mississippi and to a limited extent here in Indiana. Uh, it's really not only all about awareness. U.S. community developers may already know this as well. It's local capacity matters too. Uh, you know, even if you may have a very, very cool idea, maybe some funding, many times the local capacity may not be there. And so you've got to be familiar with it. So to me, it was not necessarily that they don't know what they don't know. It's more so they don't have the bandwidth, right? And so that was important. So we made sure to incorporate that into the training materials Again, the program itself provides a bigger picture. It kind of provides the forest uh, when many times we tr we're trying to sell trees, uh, but we fail to sell the forest, right? And so this, this uh, program has shown that it can help with other community development efforts when you show them kind of the larger picture. It does have potential for demand for extension and non-extension. Again, the robotics effort in re Eastern Indiana, that's the best uh, example. They were thinking about it. They, 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 they just didn't have any traction underneath, and uh, this kind of helped in that respect. Obviously, collaborate and partner with everybody that you can. Uh, if you're an extension educator and you're already spread thin, perhaps you can help recruit somebody else, a local champion that can take, take the lead in this program. And anything around workforce development and entrepreneurship uh, will get some traction. That's what we learned from the funding patterns. Uh, and we're trying to build this online community around this program. So those are uh, that are kind of guinea pigs pushing this out there in our extension worlds. Uh, we're hoping to start building and solidifying an online community around this process to kind of share best practices, lessons learned, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's what we learned through this process. Uh, to make and we should make, make sure we incorporated into the uh, training material. <clears throat> uh, let me speed up here. Uh, uh, so we developed uh, training materials. Uh, initially, we were going to do face-to-face -face training, but then we realized it would be better because of our online community kind of objective uh, to record the webinars, and these could be scaled up a lot easier. So there are five webinars that explain. Uh, this process uh, with the with the tweaking that I discussed in the previous slide. So we conducted and recorded five one-hour webinars to kind of provide a little more detail on how this program operates. Uh, we did 10 extension educators trained, six in Nebraska, four in Indiana, and then two external organizations from our uh, Nebraska colleagues were part of this as well. 
They were also information technology, Nebraska Information Technology Commission and the Nebraska Library Commission. It shows how the local champions or the key leaders for this process do not necessarily have to be extension, uh, which is also very good. Again, some extension colleagues are already spread thin. So if you're interested in extension, you may introduce this and maybe kind of shift it over to somebody else in the community. That's something that you may want to consider uh, if you want your community to kind of go through this process uh, with this kind of mindset change in, 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 in mind. Um, moving forward, uh, oh, uh, so expanding the ICEP, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped a slide there. Uh, one checklist report was completed by one of the uh, graduates of this program in Indiana. It is being implemented as we speak. Uh, the, uh, because of this, the, the, this process started in two more communities and there's an additional two more communities uh, that are may jumpstart this or may begin this process rather soon. Uh, and uh, I was told by my Nebraska colleagues that some components of this program, uh, you know, either the awareness side or the checklist or some of the recommendations that were learned throughout the process were utilized at a central development district meeting in Nebraska. So again, uh, that's one of the key findings that I'm going to share with you uh, shortly. Uh, so these are the results of uh, expanding this intelligent community extension program in Indiana and uh, Nebraska. <clears throat> uh, and uh, so what moving forward, uh, we learned uh, and, and I uh, really hoped that the uh, program would do this is be flexible. You don't have to do all the steps. You may pick some of the components and run with them and embed them into a larger uh, community development effort perhaps. I know that many communities are tired of, of running through these programs and so uh, we found that it, the program is very flexible and modular in a way that you can take bits and pieces and incorporate them into other processes already existing in the community. I think that's a, that's a key lesson learned here uh, moving forward. Don't think, oh my God, I have to do the whole thing. Well, if you see a part of it that may help in another project that you're doing or program, I think the program uh, lends itself to, to do that. Uh, we need obviously buy-in from extension personnel. The, I know bandwidth is limited, uh, but as mentioned earlier, it doesn't have to be you as an extension. It could be you initiating this, but then turning it over to a core group of folks that may be interested in it. Uh, we found that to be very, very cool. Uh, and we also need additional extension programming that can support this effort. Uh, so many times we, we come through the uh, checklist and the asset mapping and we identify gaps. That, that has inspired me to develop additional programming within extension that can help fill those gaps. But I'm sure that other areas may have uh, these, these things going on. So for example, the remote work again in Utah, uh, that could that fits perfectly under this scenario. Obviously, we have an eye front door program here that we're also replicating in Nebraska. That that was that was born because of this process back in Mississippi, actually. Uh, so there is a lot of room to identify areas where extension can develop programming to help address those gaps. And if extension doesn't have the capacity to do so, uh, or it's not in their wheelhouse or whatever. Uh, I am sure there may be other other online resources out there that you can then turn around and tell the community, look, these are the gaps we found, but hey, these are things you can do to address those gaps. I think that was a, that's pretty, pretty cool. And the last bullet point is the one I, I emphasize a lot all the time because I get that question. Many communities, in my experience, as I explained earlier today, uh, go down the rabbit hole of infrastructure and they don't come out. And uh, that's uh, unfortunate because there's a lot more that can be done uh, to help especially change that mindset. Um, and so you do not need ultra fast connectivity or adequate connectivity or connectivity uh, to change your mindset. And uh, this program is all about changing the mindset. Now, yes, there are uh, there is a component that talks about broadband connectivity, but many communities immediately uh, think this is all about infrastructure and they are discouraged right off the bat incorrectly because they think, well, my connectivity is terrible. This will not be useful. No, that's wrong. It can be useful. It can be parallel to connectivity. In fact, it can help 
uh, mobilize and, and uh, kind of activate some dormant assets uh, for the infrastructure side. It's, it's much broader than infrastructure. That's the key thing uh, that we've got to keep in mind that this program is not about broadband infrastructure and, and, and it's more about the community kind of perceiving or understanding the forest uh, not going down the rabbit hole of infrastructure, which as you all know, and you may be familiar with it or not, um, infrastructure is many times not in the control of the community either. And if you've managed to get a broadband action team in place or something, and you know, uh, these energetic uh, folks uh, start going through the broadband planning part on the infrastructure side, you know, it may fizzle because you, you're at the mercy of the providers and uh, this program can help them explain and see that there are other things that they can do, like knowledge workforce and entrepreneurship and robotics and other things that they do control, uh, while also keeping their eye on the infrastructure. I'm not saying to, to you know, just play dead on that side. Uh, but so this is a, a useful program to increase awareness and get the community moving on, on changing their mindset. I guess it's my main conclusion. Um, and with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet. I'm at 46 minutes. I think I'm over one minute, right, Crystal? Mark? Oh, you're fine. You're fine. We'd love to have any questions or comments um, that you can chat in the in the chat box down below. And while we're waiting for people to um, uh, input. Uh, anything there? Um, it'd be great if you could fill out this form. And and uh, Roberto, I'll, I'll ask a question because we're all in the middle of this right now. MSU um, just canceled classes and is making plans um, to send uh, students home if they're able to go home. Um, some of them are in rural areas, and we're you know our, our backup plan for holding classes is to use this technology, Zoom, to reach the students. And um, so I, I don't know what Ohio State is doing. I think, isn't Purdue classes closed as well? Correct, we, we were notified yesterday, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just, you know, in terms of uh, thinking about, uh, you know, do, do some of these communities have the bandwidth to allow students to access their classes if they're asked to go home, but yet are still expected to to attend class via Zoom? Yeah, I think that's a great point, Mark. And, and un unfortunately, I think uh, that this uh, public health crisis is going to show glaringly uh, that there is a, this is still an issue, right? That there is inadequate connectivity, not only in rural communities, but also in low-income neighborhoods where, uh, you know, some of these students may live. Um, and they're going to go back home and they're gonna, not going to be able to participate through no fault of their own. Um, and, you know, remote work and telework is now work from home is now kind of this big buzzwords where those of us in the field have been uh, known about this, have known about this and have been pushing and whatever. And now everybody's going to be like, oh, shoot, I can't work from home. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, this public health crisis is going to kind of showcase, unfortunately, that, that we still have a lot of work to do. Thanks. I've got a see question. Here. Yeah, I've got a question here. Who were the local community partners beyond the library? Uh, we we have uh, in my work. Uh, we uh, uh, sometimes it's the mayor, uh, the part-time mayor, by the way. Other times it's the local economic development organization, uh, the local economic developer. So other times it's just a community volunteer that is passionate. Uh, those are some of the key partners that we found kind of beat the drum along with this, along with the extension educator. Many times uh, in some other communities, the uh, there is no extension educator with a community development appointment or even a, an ag or whatever, uh, but the specialist may be able to connect with somebody locally and then shift, turn it over to them. Uh, hopefully that, does that answer your question? Uh, Paul, uh, yeah, I knew you were going to be asking something, my friend. Uh, how might we implement this program in our state if we have willing extension faculty and volunteers? Uh, I, I contact me and I'll be willing to uh, share with you the training material. You can go over the webinars and I can coach you as you go through them. And then once you're done, it's really uh, pick up and run with it. 
um, and then uh, just circle back through the online community. So reach out to me, Paul, and, and that's precisely why this grant was uh, sought, is uh, to, to uh, develop the materials so we can scale it uh, throughout the Midwest and the country, hopefully. So yeah, reach out to me. Uh, I don't know if there mm -hmm. are any other questions, comments. I see that Paul is typing. We'll hold off for that. Okay, there's a question. How many hours is the training? So the it's a five one-hour webinars. Uh, so it's five right off off the uh, the cusp, and then perhaps an additional five. Uh, to meet with me so I can explain a little bit more details and kind of best practices and lesson learned. So it's really not very intensive. Uh, again, it's designed to be light in a way, and it's designed to be community driven. So that kind of takes off a lot of training requirements on the extension side, on the extension end. So if you can plan around 10 hours of, of, of training, I think uh, that, uh, uh, that that should be uh, sufficient. How do you uh, how do you develop local champions? Uh, well, so what we've done in the past is uh, you know through other extension programming, uh, if uh, you know if, if the community is working on broadband infrastructure, for example, that's the perfect way to introduce this program, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to find a local champion that is uh, willing to pick this up and run with it. Other times, uh, you may hear by word of mouth, uh, the local economic developer may give you a call and say, you know what, I heard about this, uh, help me out here. Uh, the, how to actually develop a local champion, you know, that's a, uh, a webinar in and of itself. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, Hibbard, uh, uh, it, it really works through word of mouth or informal conversations. Again, the, the program is not very intensive. It's not very heavy in a way like other extension programs. So it, it's not, uh, and it's easily um, incorporated into a larger strategy. So if you already have something else going on and you want to make sure that the community is digital inclusive, you can easily attach this program to it. Well, I think maybe that's a, a really good spot to stop for this afternoon. Um, thanks everyone for joining the webinar. Thank you, Roberto, for uh, sharing your project with us. Really great stuff. Thank with you. With that, we'll, yeah, you bet. We'll close off for today and um, see you again.